The consensus wide receiver 22 is your wide receiver 13 on the week in Nico Collins at those Carolina Panthers. We've seen two incredible spike weeks from him. 7-146-1 and one against the Colts, 7-168-2 and two against the Pittsburgh Steelers. But then there have also been other contests where he's had four or fewer receptions too. Yeah, that happens. That's the nature of the wide receiver Holy two God. category. I will say the Houston Texans are ninth in implied points this week up at 23. So this is not the Texans that you were drafting Nico Collins with. This is a ready to go Texans passing offense at six and passing EPA. They've been brutal in the red zone, 27th in touchdown rate. If that regresses, which what which quite frankly is what we should expect with the offensive line getting healthier post by rookie bump CJ Stroud coming out of here. And the reason why they've been so efficient is because Nico Collins and Tank Dale have been working over the middle right now. Nico Collins is absolutely balling on these dig routes, these comeback routes, post routes, and CJ Stroud keeps finding them over and over and over the middle. And those are the most efficient targets that you get. Um, so Nico Collins right now, shocking when I look this up is one of four wide receivers in the NFL to have a yards per route run over 3.0. That is elite elite yeah. category. One of four. He has the third year breakout. Everything's there for him. Size, speed, yards after the catch, quarterback system, all that stuff is ready to go. It's time to treat Nico Collins like he deserves to be an upside wide receiver too. Yeah, love that. And I think people might cite his target share and he how he's like wide receiver 33 in that across the league. But it's a bit different when he's being targeted super far down the field and he's also winning after the catch a la like someone like Jalen Waddle from last season mm -hmm. with his size at 6'3", 215 pounds. And to your point, the Panthers are allowing 11 yards per target to outside wide receivers this year. So this is one of those situations that when we discussed so many Texans players this summer, when they had the second fewest touchdowns scored last year, and that hasn't regressed positively for us, but it was an occasion where, you know, tides lift all boats, lift all ships, right? And if they just went from like awful to average in a number of categories, we would mm -hmm. see the massive benefit of that. And again, this is one of those weeks where we should see that hit for us in terms of fantasy points. Yeah, above average in points yep. and plays now. So we got more than we bargained for. These next two rankings, are you putting your nuts on the table and being like, I am going way against what consensus is putting these guys at okay. and listen to me or don't? It's your decision. Gus Edwards is your running back Ooh. 16 this week. He's the running back 25 in consensus rankings. This is at the Arizona Cardinals. Talk to me. The bus is best driven in positive game strips, and they are 8.5 point favorites over the Cardinals. The Cardinals are not only the third worst fantasy running back defense, they're also allowing the second most carries in Gus Bus when they are playing with the lead. The Ravens are down to run the ball up the middle with Gus Bus. We had that 80 yard fluky reception, not putting much emphasis on that at all. I just think that the Baltimore offense has been ready to explode. We saw it last week, and Gus Edwards got a goal line carry. He's open to big plays because of how Lamar Jackson's being covered, and the Arizona defense does not scare me at all. So with the Ravens projected for a bunch of points in positive game scripts, this is the time to play Gus Edwards. Um, I'm going against not only consensus rankings, but the fantasy usage model as well. He's running back 26 over the last month, but got to listen to the game scripts. He has out-touched Justice Hill 32 to 16 over the past two games. With leads. Yep. With leads. After him, it's Terry McLaurin, who has rebounded in a big way when yes. it comes to fantasy football, meaning he received a high target share over the last four games in comparison to the opening three. And the last time he actually played the Philadelphia Eagles, eight of 10 targets for 86 yards. Um, I will add... The nature of Sam Howell is going to be high variance. So I don't know if we can like copy what we saw in that game and plug it into this one. It does scare me. He's going to be under pressure a ton here. But at the same time, Eagles have been applying pressure on with their defensive line, but it's still been getting lit up in the secondary. The commanders have more or less abandoned the run. They're now sixth in neutral pass rate. And looking at the injury report for the Eagles, Bradley Roby's on there, didn't hasn't practiced this week. James Bradbury's been limited. Both of them dealing with injuries. There's a reason why the Eagles just traded for Kevin Byard. It's because they don't like what their secondary looks like right now. And Terry McLaurin, just because he's been owning Jahan Dotson and Curtis Samuel, is up to the wide receiver 18 
in usage. So scared that the bottom can uh, fall out here with Sam Howell, but everything else is pointing in Terry McLaurin's direction. Geno Smith is next for you. He is facing the Cleveland Browns defense. Uh, I will add, though, that the Seahawks are favored in this game. Does that change anything for you? It's a very tough matchup. There's just no way around it. Um, the Browns defense right now are doing a couple exceptional things. Uh, number one, their adjusted sack rate is the best in the league. That's what happens when you have Miles Garrett. They're forcing teams into pass or passing the ball at the lowest rate in neutral situations. I think that's because teams are uh, terrified of Miles Garrett and of Denzel Ward. And then even when teams are deciding to pass the ball against Cleveland, this chart was shocking to me again. Looking at the prayer targets, which are sideline targets down the field, very low percentage targets. The Browns are forcing those at the highest rate in the league. There's no easy buttons against Cleveland. You're either running the ball against them, which is bad, or you're throwing the ball to the sideline and downfield with Denzel Ward in your hip pocket. So Geno Smith's got his hands full with this one. That said, he at least has DK Metcalf likely coming back. He was a full yep. practice participant on Wednesday. They definitely need him. The Seahawks team total is down to under 21 points, which is lower than they typically are at home. And I think that's completely justified. This defense is very good. Last week, they got exposed on a broken play, free play for, with Josh Downs. But I think for the most part, they held their own. Yeah, and a long Michael Pittman catch and run as well. Uh, and Richard Barr's worksheet, he points out that the Browns are playing man coverage at the highest rate in the NFL. We say that every single week. And so, so far this season, Geno Smith is actually last in the NFL with just 3.6 yards per attempt against man coverage. So something to watch for. But I think the big storyline here is Trey McBride, um, second rounder from last season. He came on to the year late uh, after um, Zach Ertz missed late last season. In his five games with 80% or more of the snaps, he's averaged 40 yards, which gets him right on that tight end one-two conversation. It's obviously harder for McBride to score a touchdown because of the Cardinals offense, but I don't know how this has happened. I'm not sure if this is an accounting error, whatever it is, but Trey McBride right now is a tight end three in yards per route run. I haven't seen a single highlight tape of his yet um, to, to warrant that, but the reality is he's going to be a full-time player in an offense that needs to see what their young players have. And that's what Trey McBride is right now.